Really sad, eh? Yeah, now there are six. six. Yeah, I need to. I suggest you to remove the waiting room so that people can just straight away join. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Uh, Doctor Pasundi, you got muted, I think. Dr. Pasindu, we can't hear you. You have to start from the beginning. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry, we'll, we'll start again. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, third webinar uh, organized by CILT on uh, road safety. Uh, so today we have a very important uh, topic uh, looking at uh, strategies for the next uh, decade of action uh, with, when, when it comes to road safety. And uh, for that, we have invited uh, a, a very distinguished uh, personality uh, in, in terms of academia as well as in research, uh, Professor Saman Bandara, a senior professor from uh, University of uh, Morotua. So I will, before I hand it over to him, I will just give a, a brief introduction uh, of his uh, very illustrious career as an academic. So uh, Professor Saman Bandara is a senior professor in the Department of Civil Engineering, University of Morotua. Professor Bandara is no stranger to the uh, transport and logistics sector, as well as the uh, CILT community, because he served as the president of CILT back in 2007. And uh, he's also served as the uh, chairman of the Road Development Authority in 2015. And uh, uh, over the last um, past few decades, he's been appointed as board member of various uh, state institutions uh, related to uh, transportation. So. Uh, that's why I said he's no stranger to the uh, sector. And also when it comes to um, academic side, uh, Professor Bandara is one of the pioneers in developing the transport and uh, logistics related academic programs at the university level. Uh, in Department of Civil Engineering, he, he played a key, key role in developing the uh, Transportation Engineering Division, uh, which, uh, which was established under uh, Department of Civil Engineering and also the introduction of the uh, postgraduate programs uh, in highway and traffic engineering, as well as a master's in, in transportation. So all of those key developments in, in the academic side, when it comes to the uh, transport and logistics sector, uh, Professor Bandara had played a, a very significant role. And uh, he also uh, served as the head of the Department of Transport and Logistics Management uh, when it was first established at the University of Morotua. And uh, that was back in 2005. And from 2005 to uh, 2008, he, he served as the head of the uh, uh, transport and logistics management department. So in addition to that, he has the distinction of serving as the head of two departments in, in, in the University of Morotua because he served the head of uh, civil engineering department also uh, in 2017 and 18. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Bandara's doctoral research, which he did in University of Calgary in the area of airport terminal uh, planning and operations, he uh, is one of the breakthrough findings in, in that sector. And, uh, and still, uh, one of those papers are highly cited by uh, researchers uh, in, in the terminal operations and planning sector. Uh, and Professor Saman Bandara has also served as the team leader for most of the uh, major transport infrastructure development projects in Sri Lanka, including uh, expressways, uh, the recent uh, expressway projects, including Ruanpur Expressway, and as well as the uh, Central Expressway project, and also various uh, feasibility studies done in the railway sector, uh, the um, extension of different railway lines in, in the country, as well as uh, transit development projects. Uh, on the subject of road safety, he has uh, vast experience and, and published numerous uh, papers in journals and international conferences um, and uh, supervised several students uh, at masters and, 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 and uh, doctoral level on, on road safety related uh, 
research and he was instrumental in developing the uh, road safety action plan for sri lanka that was uh, initiated under the decade of action in 2010 by who and and that is one of the reasons that we wanted him to uh, uh, join this uh, webinar series so that he can share his expertise in this area because he played a very important role in in developing a action plan for the first time in sri lanka that was uh, part of the decade of action in 2010 so i can go on and on uh, uh, you know introducing the various achievements of uh, prof bandara's very illustrious career but uh, we are pressed for time i can i can stop now and while thanking him again for accepting our invitation to join the webinar i will now hand it over to prof saman bandara thank you dr pasidu for the kind introduction uh i will straight away uh go to the the topic the topic assigned to be is road safety action plan for sri lanka priorities for next decade now when you consider road safety interventions there are different approaches traditional approach that had been used in the past was can be considered as reactive approach and recently it was changed to the approach you know more proactive how in the traditional approach we focus how and why the accident happened and then we investigate chain of events of circumstances lead to the accident and focus on finding someone to blame or punish for the accident so this is what uh, Uh, you know, uh, we are practicing still in Sri Lanka. So, if police cannot find somebody to blame, they try to you know put the blame on both parties, right? And say avoid to be put an accident. However, the modern approach. So we accept the need to understand causes for accident in total or system context, and identify a number of enabling factors that are necessary, but itself not sufficient for an accident, such as human error, equipment failure, and latent condition. Now, if you go to statistics in any country, you will see that human error is contributing to Majority of the accident. It's you know it's a you know it's a necessary factor anyway. If there is no human error, there won't be an crash or accident. But because of the error only, we will end up with a crash. But in addition, there can be other reasons such as equipment failure or latent conditions. So now, during recently, uh, the approach has further improved or changed towards what you call safe system approach. Because as the human body is vulnerable to injury, and also human will make mistakes, the safety of all parts of the system, that is, for users, the vehicle, and the road, we have to. improve to help minimize in the impact of those mistakes so what we really need is to develop a road transport system that can better accommodate human error and take into consideration the vulnerability of human body rather than just maintain a focus on human error
So latest studies or latest approaches road safety, the principles are based on this. People make mistakes. And human body is vulnerable to impact forces. And the road system needs to guide safe behavior and provide a second chance. And also shared responsibility. So most of the countries are now working on this aspect or these principles to improve road safety. So what is needed? First of all, we need a commitment to reduce accidents or crashes. We need to have a culture, a safety culture. But it will not enough. We need procedures and reporting mechanisms, collect, analyze and share information and carry out investigations, training personnel, sharing best practices, and also monitoring what is happening. So these all these are required to have a good action plan if we are really interested in reducing action. Now, when you evaluate the mitigatory options available, it is important that we have to note that all risk mitigation measures may not have the same potential for reducing risk. So therefore, it is necessary to evaluate options available before we go and implement whether this particular action will give us the result that we are expecting or the outcome. Now, how you measure this uh, uh, how are we going to evaluate? So we can evaluate with respect to effectiveness, Ease of implementation, cost and the benefit, practicality, challenges and acceptability, enforceability, durability, and and also you have to consider the residual risk and possible due problem. Because when you try to do something, you know, something else can happen. For example, so when a traffic signal is introduced at a intersection where there are a lot of crossing type of accidents, the crossing type accidents will reduce, but rear end type accidents will go up. So there are so many uh, parameters that we have to take into account. So it's basically uh, you know, we have different criteria, and we may have to go for multi criteria approach in evaluating the options. So, I will elaborate these things a little in a while because I don't have time to go into details. Now, effectiveness is that you know, you can implement something. But we need to figure out, because of that, how many accidents have been you know, reduced or we eliminated uh, how many uh, crashes or how many deaths. For that, you know, we need to follow up. And certain activities are easy to implement, but certain activities are harder. And sometimes there are challenges and acceptability by 
the road users. Sometimes you do some things in good faith, but the users may not accept it. And also, it's very important that if you cannot enforce, you should not go and engage in an action. Right? Because after a while, it will become you know, uh, or useless or you may not be able to implement it afterwards because it failed even though it is you know could be could have been defective now i'll give you a very simple one example to cover most of these now road, crossing the road so it's a shared responsibility that is the pedestrian as well as the drivers or the vehicles must give way for each other. Now what happens if you know there's a road where you know traffic flow is very low and you have enough gaps to cross the road. And as a road safety measure we go and introduce pedestrian crossings at, you know, certain interval, maybe 100 meters or 200 meters, whatever. So people are used to cross as and when necessary because it is safe to cross in that. You can find gaps. But when you introduce uh, uh, pedestrian crossings, Sorry, I think I have muted for some time for some reason. There's, there are a lot of disturbances. Uh, can somebody tell me, you know, where I got muted? Only for a few words, sir. It's all right. You can oh, continue. Okay. Because this, uh, the, 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 you know, waiting room thing is popping up. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. So I was talking about pedestrian crossings. So drivers expect people to cross at crossings, but people still can cross at they wish. So there is a potential risk now. But when the flow increases, people realize that you know it is not safe to cross. They will uh, go to a pedestrian crossing, and majority will cross at the crossing. And still, you know, certain percentage will cross at any point. And we cannot enforce this because you know, it's not practical. Right? It's only the education and, you know, uh, acceptability is important. Now, now what happened, you know, if you go and signalize all these pedestrian crossings. Traffic flow may be a little higher now. Right? So we had uh, marked pedestrian crossing. All of a sudden, you put signals on all the pedestrian crossings. Right? From input-wise, it's good because they have signalized this many pedestrian crossings. So we will deliver what we want or our, what are the outcome. Now, the drivers will not look at the pedestrian crossing even because they are looking at the signal. But pedestrians, you know, when they find uh, gaps, they will cross irrespective whether the signal is red dog. And pedestrian had gone, vehicles will have to stop, and there will be additional delays. And when you get delays at most of these pedestrian crossings, then you are in a hurry and you can make mistakes. 
So it's very important. What is the level of intervention that we should go in any road safety uh, you know, strategy or activity uh, to reduce accidents? Just because we have resources, we should not go and implement things. We have to evaluate. We have to see the you know, acceptability and enforceability. And also, on top of that, residual risk and possible new problems. So I'll come back to the topic where you know, we are supposed to talk about uh, action plan. So what we need to do is preference should be given to measures that could contribute most towards eliminating risk. So here we have to use the monitoring and evaluation concept where we evaluate the outcomes, not the inputs or outputs, the expected outcomes, whether we are achieving them. And also, to have a successful implementation, we are certain prerequisites. The policies, procedures, and processes are required. Without that, we cannot go forward. Funding and capacity is required. In addition, accident-related information, traffic-related information, road inventory related information and other socio-economic related information are required. So these are prerequisites. So whether we like it or not, we need to have access if we really want to do a good job. And having information is not enough. We need to analyze and identify potential risk factors and based on the analysis, we have to draw valid conclusions regarding effectiveness of different strategies. Now, going back to 2011, where uh, WHO came up with the Road Safety Action Plan for 2011 to 2020. Under five categories or five pillars, they proposed a decade of action. Sri Lanka also, in 2011, started or accepted and started on this. And here, uh, the actions or the activities are categorized into five pillars road safety management, where it comes under built road safety management capacity, safer roads and mobility, safer vehicles, safer roads and post class response. The, the title given below are the ones that have been used at that time. And Sri Lanka also we came up with an action plan. National Council for Road Safety came up with a national plan under you know covering you know these five pillars. So under that action plan, there were a total of 35 strategies, and under 35 strategies, there were 179 activities listed. However, you know, when it comes to 2015, we found that most of the other countries have gone forward. We were there, right, at the same place, or little small movement when it comes to 2015. So NCRS, along with WHO, revisited this action plan and uh, there were some outdated activities. They were removed and also figured out that there are a large number of activities listed and 
there are various stakeholders have been identified for a signal signal activity so that is one reason why it has not happened because everybody expect the other party to deliver so this was updated and revised but at the same time uh, another concept is called uh, sustainable development goals there is 2030 agenda for sustainable development came up and under that the road safety is included one of the key uh, target was to reduce global road traffic deaths and injuries by 50% by 2020 So some countries uh, in 2020 only they reduced it because of the less traffic. But uh, when you consider the the global scenario, so many countries uh, move towards this goal. Right, 35, 40 percent have been achieved. But uh, unfortunately. The other situation is the number has increased. Right? No reduction, especially the fatalities. And then target eleven point two and goal nine also address road safety and what to achieve in twenty thirty. So now. This decade of action and this have got got you know amalgamated or combined, and this is how the world is moving. So we also did a small study because under sustainability and transport there are five areas identified: accessibility, affordability, safety, security, and environmental concerns. And the study that we have done. We saw that there are 57 SDG targets related to sustainable transportation, directly or indirectly. Out of that, 13 are looking at safety and 14 are looking at security. Security is slightly different from safety, but we can put them together. So, in other words, you know, 27 out of 57, some way or the other. Connected to safety, so a higher weightage has been given. And then <clears throat> we have to look at uh, you know developing the action plan. Okay. So that, that is the topic. How we should move forward. So here we have to look at the vision, policy, strategies, and At the lowest level, actions. So actions are taken by or uh, actions have to be taken up by the stakeholder institutions, but they have to be in line with what is on top. So what is the vision? And it's very clear: safe road for all. Right? So everybody agrees on. And what are the policies? Right? We don't have written or accepted transport policy or safety policy, but in general, the policy should be for safety to be given political priority, effective legislation to ensure maximum safety standards, strict enforcement of safety regulations. Promote road safety strategy for health promotion. Motor vehicles to meet safety standards. Promote educational awareness and campaign programs towards road safety. So within these policy guidelines, 
we have to come up with strategies to come up with the strategies we need to analyze problems so what problems are we going to solve we can't just arbitrarily select something and put it in the strategy so what are the targets right? macro level and micro level targets and then we can uh, you know formulate the action which call action plan where we monitor the outcomes to see whether we are achieving the targets so this part has to be there otherwise we don't do what has happened. Right? so outcomes must be identified so when you are going to identify the outcomes you do exactly you know you have to look at each of the action under the different criteria i mentioned earlier right whether we look at you know enforceability practicality uh, acceptability all these things need to be uh, considered so automatically it happens if you focus on the outcome what we are going to achieve by implementing this particular action so without that just for the sake of implementing if you try to do that you know it will be a fail so i don't want to name uh, you know some actions that had failed during the you know recent past you all know so you can look at it look at them and figure out why those were failed now when it uh, you know when we are preparing the action plan so number of parameters considered especially who is the leading lead agency to implement partner agency where you need the support what is the expected outcome and effectiveness and impact the cost ease of implementation what are the key performance indicators to measure the outcome and the timeline of implementation so any activity has to be looked at you know with respect to these criteria so lead agency is the key institution responsible for this activity and there will be some partner institution whose uh, support will be required and then any activity you have to mention what's the expected outcome if the proposed activity is fully implemented what can we expect what is the pro what is the problem that you are going to solve and we requested the stakeholders to measure the effectiveness you can't you know give a real value so whether it is highly effective moderate effective or less effective high moderate low so at the same time we have to look at cost especially in country like us cost is also important so with a high cost moderate cost and low cost and then how easy to implement whether it is easy moderate or hard and what are the performance indicators that we can use or measure to evaluate whether we are reaching the outcome and finally the timeline whether we can do it short term medium term and long Now, when you identify the above, uh, the, sorry, these are some of the activities that identified in the 2015 revised action plan. We don't have to go into detail. I just want to show that you know that has been done by NCRS, that is National Council for Road Safety. So we can put everything 
in a chart like this. The x axis represent ease of implementation from hard to easy. Y axis represent the impact or effectiveness from low to high. And activities, we can divide into two categories, strategic activities and prerequisites. Because prerequisites, you know, we will have to go ahead irrespective of its implementation easiness or the impact. Because it sometimes, if it is really required, you have to do it. So the brown color ones, let's say, those are prerequisites, and the pink color ones are standard. So when you look at it, so when it comes to the first quadrant here, right? So these are easy to implement, high impact, so it can be shorter towards the right hand side. Towards the left hand side. So it can be long term. Right? So likewise, we can screen the activities. Right? We should not jump and you know try to start everything at the same time. We can prioritize and you know start implementing. For successful implementation, we need the commitment to deal with road accidents from higher levels, political commitment. So in 2011, it was there, but lower level commitment was not there. But now I don't know. A clear vision and targets for reduction in the different type of activity. And a broad strategy involving education, engineering, and enforcement to deal with that. A concrete plan with specific measures for implementation and enforcement. And also institution coordination. This is very important. Otherwise, you know. You will see a situation where I pass in the board and nothing happens. And on top of everything, you know, you need to have careful critical evaluation of measures and their effectiveness. For that, we need information or data. Otherwise, we don't know. Otherwise, we have to rely on assumptions. But the validity of assumptions, nobody looks unless you have information to, you know, justify or uh, you know, show it will happen. So quickly, under road safety management, you know, what is more important? is to have a systematic process reducing you know the number and the severity of crashes and we have to have activities to strengthen the cooperation between government institutions that are in Sri Lanka there are so many institutions uh, related to road safety if you take national council for road safety there are 16 parties 16 organizations and also, there is overlapping responsibility, so you have to have a very clear, clear you know, identification of your responsibility. And also, integrated data management system for road safety to strengthen reporting uh, structure and ensure monitoring and evaluation. So, whether you like it or not, if you are really keen on you know, implementing your Road safety action plan to achieve 2030 targets. We need this. Right. So you can uh, go into detail and you know come up with strategies, and then the stakeholders can come up with their action plan. 
safer road and mobility is actually going beyond adhering to design standard and city of size because different user groups require special consideration now last webinar dr das talked about you know most of these situations so i am not going to elaborate but you know, so these are the priority areas and safer vehicles so this is very important for future because there is a significant improvement in occupant protection and active safety technologies of vehicles right just having the reverse camera now there are so many other features right coming with no normal vehicles lane departure warning blind spot identification uh, cross traffic uh, and parking assistant and all this right so the world is moving towards autonomous and connected vehicles so you need to identify and provide necessary infrastructure to make use of these improvements right so there's no point having in you know, a vehicle with you know lane departure warning when there is no lane mark right and most of the sensors in these vehicles you know the category 2 3 vehicles category 5 is the fully autonomous it's uh, you know most sensing is done vision, using vision so consistency is very important for example traffic signal we are going to have different different types of signals signal hedge arrangements you know it will have negative consequences so you need to have some sense but to a country like us we cannot expect you know or in the world also you know, the vehicle fleet will not change overnight it will be slow but it is important for us to support uh, to identify low cost but safer vehicles we know that you know there are some vehicles if meet with an accident you are sure to die at a certain speed I guys you know was you know very open i see photographs vehicles crushed right for a small accident the people are not safe so we need to have information to tell the people right so these are the safe vehicles so who we got to safe road users we need to strengthen law enforcement efforts here what is important is not having more people on the road to enforce we need to use the technology yeah we can come up with evidence based approach yeah you know any enforcement with evidence so that nobody will argue right so we have to use technology now some countries such as south africa they have identified under this you know uh eliminating or minimizing corruption those the right? enforcement sometimes related to that as well not always and on top of that you know we need to improve skills and abilities of drivers and we need to educate community involved or community involvement is post crash responses we have to simplify the access to post crash care so I think you know we have a fairly good system but sometimes there can be delays due to procedures and we have to come up with you know increase effectiveness for first response so these are few things that i feel we need to give priority for the next 10 years
So the university, we have, uh, you know, not forgotten these and we have done a lot of activities and you know, I'm just showing some of the activities we have carried out research in recent times. Right? So one is a database where you can combine all together, it's important. Driver abnormal behavior detection because now all the vehicles, you know, you can't expect to have these features, right? So we need to have some alternative arrangements to improve, uh, you know, the situation. So this is a mobile app that has been developing. And active road signs because connected vehicles communicate with signs and signals and also between vehicles. So a lot of research going on. Uh, and some already developed and you know applied for the patent. So it can warn about pedestrian topics and signal train approach you can fix like that. Mission based uh, traffic signals. So traffic signal automatically adjusted depending on the traffic. So the vision system has been developed to capture vehicle movements, even pedestrian movements. You can see here. And also university has contributed to developing the Sri Lanka accident data management system. Right. Which was handed over to police and police is implementing a pilot study. And so that those are a few things that we have done. And finally, you know, to have a successful action plan, we need to have two things. One is the community involvement. Community support is critical. Because effective stakeholder engagement can reduce road risk by ensuring all community needs. Local knowledge and expertise is required and improving the public acceptance for road safety enforcement can achieve only through this. And also media involvement so media has a responsibility that at the moment road traffic crashes are covered as events and not as one of the leading you know course of death. So loss to countries, human health and financial resources are not really highlighted. So you show accidents and you know this may be injured, this may be died, that's all. Okay. So you need to frame road safety as a health and development story with data and in-depth information right? so that not only public but we can influence the policy makers. So media has a big role to play. Right. So with this, you know, keeping in mind, if we can come up with an action plan, I'm sure that we will be able to go towards, you know, reducing accidents to some extent and uh, you know only thing is we need to have commitment thank you right so uh we can open the forum for questions. Uh, I think there is, since still others get ready, there's. There's a question uh, uh, posted. Uh, 
answer the question whether we could streamline activities pertaining to the behavior of especially three wheelers and motorcycles as a whole as i hope most of the accidents are due to the involvement of these two types of transport it also gives a bad impression bad example sorry bad example as all the others get bad influences uh, as there's no action to curtail this bad behavior by these uh, these road users Yeah, so now yeah. this is where we need to have statistics. Now, if you take the you know the entire world as a whole, it's a fact that you know pedestrians, motorcycles, and the bicycles are the vulnerable uh, you know road users. But here in Sri Lanka, we have three leaders. We need to find out from data that we have, but I do not have access to the latest because I was away from the country for some time. Uh, so pedestrians, I think, still the highest or the second, and followed by uh, motorcycles and three leaders. So that's why. We have to have a target, right? So if most of the victims are these categories, we have to focus more on that. And also, we have to find out what type of vehicles meet with accident, and the damage was extent of that. And then we can identify. What are the safer vehicles and what are the what are not so safer vehicles? The second question from Manjula De Silva: A lot of critical accidents happen during the night and early hours. Uh, early hours in the morning. Do you think a presence of stronger presence of traffic police during these times will help to address this issue? We don't think so, because it is not related to presence of police or not. It's depend on the time, visibility, and your uh, your sleepiness and things like that. And presence of uh, traffic police might, you know, go the other way around as well. So what is important is that uh, you know, we have to come up with a system where it will accommodate you know all these mistakes, right. especially in the morning. You know the visibility is such, and you have uh, roads where you can go fast. Right. So unless we have technology. To you know, air force, it will you know not help you know just having police there, because the police has a role to play, right? So they can't uh, man the road you know 24 hours, and we have to the, the entire world is moving away, you know, from the manual systems. You know. We should not go back. Hope that clarifies uh, the question here. Um, next one from Asankar Atnaik. How about monitoring and evaluation of human behavioral characteristics and social and psychological attitudes towards the road safe? Well, you know, it's a difficult task, right? Because the behavior is something, you know, it's difficult to monitor. But behavior changes. Can happen when the environment changes. So you need to have a good environment, then the behavior will change automatically. Now, one of the examples that I have been using, you know, in training programs, is that we ask, especially the motorcycles and three wheelers. So why not you obey uh, the, uh, you know? Your turn, you know. Why you want 
wait in the queue, one behind the other. So there is no answer for that. We dump the queue. But then I ask, you know, when you go to bank, will you do that? Will you dump the queue? So they say no. What's the reason? The reason is then you are treated as a bad person because the environment there is such that, you know, if you jump the queue, you get caught. And you will be treated as a person who has done something wrong. So that attitude has to come to road as well. Right? So this behavior, you know, as you ask, you know, it's difficult to monitor. But we have to come up with strategies and changing the environment to change the behavior. I hope that answered the question. There's a lot of questions, so we'll move on to the next one. Uh, what is the progress uh, of the road safety action plan achieved so far since 2015? And what are the target, in, what, what target indicates expected by 2013? Example, uh, number of accident reductions per year. Well, with respect to activities uh, by 2015, when we really looked at it, you know, about 10% has been achieved. But that is as input. As outcomes, uh, the number of accidents have not reduced. That has gone up. So we cannot say that uh, you know we have achieved anything. Yeah. And now, 2020, the total numbers may be low because of this traffic. But otherwise. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka, we are observing or we have seen gradual increase in crashes and the, uh, the deaths and the injuries. It's true that the traffic is improving, but you know, but if you have a target to reduce, we have to reduce. So, what is important is that we have to implement strategies or activities that will directly contribute towards this, not anything else. So that is what is required. Okay, sir, the next question is on uh, how complex is the crash data management system in Sri Lanka? Do we always depend on the crash data recorded by the traffic police or do other agencies have a record of this data too? At the moment, we have to depend on traffic police. That is somewhat comprehensive. But only thing is, it's not up to date. Up to date in the sense that you know that the data is collected based on the, the, the data identified way back, you know, about 20 years back. But today, with the capacity of computation and also technology available, we need some more information so that we can analyze it. But changing that accident data form. It's a complex process. It has to go to the parliament, and you know, therefore, it is not happening. So, some of the information that should have been there is not there. On top of that, we have uh, data with uh, insurance companies. They are supposed to share information with police, but their recording system is different. But when technology is away, you know, there you can combine this. One of the biggest problem we have is, you know, how to, uh, you know, clean this data, how to identify double counting, because if you have an accident, two vehicles will go to two different uh, insurance companies. So they record this as an accident in each of these. So how are we going to you know, clean this data is a question. And also, uh, uh, you know, active uh, collaboration of uh, uh, sharing data is important because at the moment this data is considered, uh, you know, somewhat confidential. So therefore, uh, uh, you know, that we can, that data cannot be extracted for any useful purposes. So that's something that we have to look at. 
we tried but a uh, couple of times but not successful and self reporting is another you know mechanism again we need to figure out how to clean data because one accident one crash can be counted more than once so we need to have mechanism to filter so that is the situation at the moment um just another clarification uh, this um, the impact of developing the public transport sector with respect to reducing the accidents so there's a comment uh, requesting you to uh, discuss uh, whether that has an impact uh, improve whether shifting uh, uh, you know more trips to public transport will in fact uh, reduce uh, uh, road crashes uh it's you know it can go both ways it depends on how the road user behavior would be because when it comes to public transport you need to access the public transport for that you may be a pedestrian or a cyclist or use a three wheeler or a motorcycle and there is a exchange so you have to change the so all these situations your exposure increases and also the safety of public transport at the moment is also a question so we need to go into uh, you know more details and if we find that certain activities of you know movements of public transport service providers are resulting in you know crashes we have to address that first just because you put more people in the buses you cannot expect that you know the road crashes will uh, reduce that has to be analyzed very carefully so it can go it can go both ways in my opinion uh, there's another question i will rephrase the question uh, is the, it's on enforcement uh, he is asking uh, when police are, are enforcing uh, speed uh, violations uh, they often uh, hide the uh, at those locations uh, the question is uh, is that the way approach or should be should they be more visible so that you know all all drivers uh, are, are alerted and then they slow down rather than you know trying to catch uh, as many people as possible uh, or should they be more visible so that uh, you know all, all drivers uh, are aware that speed enforcements are in place yeah so it's a very good question because first we have to find out what is the objective if you really wants to reduce the speed the visibility is important you say only you you be careful right. if you want to increase the revenue to the government is the other way around what is happening now is that so you have to come up with your key performance indicators right that is very important because if you set the key performance indicators as the number of detections you are compelled to hide that detect right so in my opinion high number of detection beats is a system failure because no more people are going fast if you cannot catch anybody for speed in that is the good system so we need to change the way that we are thinking i think police need to change their kpis if we really wants to achieve what we want so if we have a good system nobody should be speeding if more people are speeding means now if police say this this day or this month we have you know captured this many that means you know nobody is you know they are about the speed limit. So that is my opinion. Uh, Doctor Basu, I cannot hear you. Sorry, one more question on uh, insurance companies. From uh, Manjula De Silva is uh, is asking uh, insurance companies have a very good database on motor accidents. Has anyone used this to perform any analysis? I think Amanda touched upon this. I think I mentioned about it because there is a reluctance to share this information. even for research purposes and also as i told you 
is uh, double counting. So multiple counting is something that we need to address first if we are to use this information. There is no single database because all the data goes through their individual data. But what we need is the integrated database. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any more questions? Uh, we still have a few more minutes. Anyone wants to raise a question? Okay, I think uh, all the clarifications have been made. Uh, so, uh, conclude now, and uh, I will like to thank. Uh, on behalf of CILT again uh, to uh, Professor Saman Bandar, I think that was a very, uh, uh, very enlightened session on, on uh, at a policy level, what we should do on, on road safety related strategies. So we are very thankful for Professor Saman Bandar who has uh, who's been a uh, continue to support uh, all these endeavors in the past. So uh, on behalf of everyone, uh, I would like to thank him. Uh, and thank you all to the participants. Uh, I think we have a very good, uh, uh, very good uh, number of uh, participation uh, for today's forum. Uh, more than 100, I think, participated. Um, there's one more question. I think, uh, Professor Bandara, if you are available. Yes. Uh, effectiveness of having road humps uh, by Dr. Tisa Lianegi uh, is the as a safety concern. Dr. Tisa, if you're online, you can ask. Uh, Professor, good evening. Actually, um, I, I made it very short uh, just to uh, get a good idea of uh, there are a lot of road terms at uh, places where uh, necessary and where it is not necessary. Some places it is sometimes uh, create more issues like that. So um, what, is the, what is the present uh, applications and practice, uh, how that uh, works in Sri Lanka? Thank you, sir. Well, you know, Sri Lanka, you know, I cannot commit because there's no <laughs> no systematic way. You know, road hump is a measure, but getting outdated. Okay? And it is good for the roads where you have very slow speeds. But anything more than 30 kilometers per hour road, you know, road, road hump is a, is a safety, uh, you know, trap, in my opinion. How well you design. But if for local roads, you may use it. But uh, nowadays, it's going out of use because there are so many other technologies available. Right? So it, it, I, I would say it's outdated, but if you really want to use, should use it, you know, places where you expect lower speeds. Especially less than 30 kilometers per hour. Right. Thank you. Thank you all for again uh, actively engaging in this uh, discussion. I think everyone will have again some uh, new knowledge on, on uh, road safety strategies. So, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to conclude uh, this. Uh, uh, webinar and also inform you that uh, the next webinar uh, will be in February. Uh, uh, DIG Ajit Rona had agreed to uh, uh, participate as a guest speaker and he will talk on the legislative and enforcement related issues on road safety. Uh, we will keep you informed of the, the date once uh, the date is finalized. Thank you very much and good night. Okay, thank you.